He's never shied away from controversy. Former Anglican Bishop John Spong. The American theologian's books have sold more than a million copies. To some, he's a visionary who wants to reform Christianity. But to others, he's a heretic out to destroy the church. His latest book is called Jesus for the Non-Religious. I want to start with the title of your book, Jesus for the Non-Religious. Some might say this, you know, why if you're not religious, what do you care about Jesus at all? I mean, who are you trying to reach here? Who are you talking to? Now, the first thing I'd say is I think it's important to know that the word religion does not even appear in the Jewish vocabulary because God was a presence that permeated all of life, not just an area of life called religion. So that I'd really like to get the Christian faith out of the religious business. The second reason was that one of my heroes is a German Lutheran theologian named Dietrich Bonhoeffer who was executed by the Nazis in 1945. And he said in some of his prison letters that Christianity, in, in order to become a universal religion, had to transcend the boundaries of Judaism and that we've reached a point in our history where Christianity, if it's going to survive, has got to transcend the boundaries of religion because religion has become very negative. When religion makes the news in my country, it has to do with priests abusing children or lawsuits. It has to do with bashing homosexual people. It has to do with male institutions trying to prescribe to women uh, how they might properly use their bodies or morally use their bodies vis-a-vis -vis birth control or abortion. And the idea that religion has devolved into being concerned only about those issues, all of which are sexual issues about which the Christian church knows very little, I think is a tragedy. I don't want to be identified with that. Well, in fact, you've refuted a lot of the literal interpretation of the Bible and, and said that we are now witnessing the death of Christianity as it's been historically understood. Expand on that. Well, I think that's accurate. Uh, the two movements that I see, at least in America today, in religion are a rush back to a fundamentalistic pre-modern mentality that reminds me of simply an hysterical response to the, to the death of religion. You're going to deny it. And the other response, which is even bigger but doesn't make the press, is a response of those who say, well, if that's what religion is, that fundamentalistic pre-modern thing, I don't want any part of it. And so they become members of what I call the Church Alumni Association, which is the fastest growing organization in the Christian West. These are the believers in exile. These are the believers in exile. Now, if, you're, if you look at the United States, and I'm, I'm not sure whether the pattern is similar in Canada, but the United States is a very secular country in the Northeast and mm -hmm. on the West Coast, and it's a very religious country in the interior and in the South. And if you go to Europe, you realize that, that organized religion is in a very sad state of affairs over there. We have enormous churches that have been turned into museums. The average age of a priest in Belgium, which is a total Roman Catholic country, is in the 70s, and they don't have anybody in the pipeline coming up. If you go to Finland, I'm told that the, the, the Finns, who are basically Lutherans, about 95% of them claim membership in the Lutheran Church. But I was told by an authoritative source in Finland that only 4% of the Finns ever are in church even one time a year, and that includes funerals and baptisms and weddings, so that people just simply aren't going to church. Now, that means that we've reached a point in our society where the message that comes out of the church doesn't make contact with the world in which people are living. So religion, Christianity in its traditional form is more and more a relic of yesterday. And I don't think you can revivify a corpse. I think you've got to find a new way to articulate. Well, let's talk about that new way because that's what the book is, uh, is all about. You see, it has to start with the separation of Jesus the man from Jesus the myth. I explain that. Well, Clearly, a person named Jesus of Nazareth lived. You believe that there was a historic Absolutely. Jesus? Absolutely. I would here. disagree with my friend Tom Harper right. about that. I think there is a person, and I think there, the things that convince me of that is that he was called Jesus of Nazareth, and Nazareth was a town upon which everybody looked down. If you're going to develop a myth, you're not going to have him born in Nazareth, and that's why there's an early movement to say, well, he really was born in Bethlehem to get him out of Nazareth. So there is a person named Jesus of Nazareth. But around that Jesus has been wrapped an enormous myth. Now, before we get into that, I think also very, very important, uh, not only in this book but in your earlier works, is that you've given us some insight into uh, both when the Gospels, especially in the New Testament, were written and how they were written and the intent of the, uh, of the writing. Tell me about, uh, about that. Well, the first thing that we need to embrace is that the Gospels are written 40 to 70 years after the life of Jesus has come to right. an end. 
That's two to three generations in that period of history. Secondly, they're written in Greek, which is not the language that Jesus spoke. He spoke Aramaic. So before you and I read the first word that we read in the Gospels about Jesus, a minimum of 40 to 70 years has passed since the word was actually spoken, and a translation has taken place. Now the question that needs to be asked is where did the memory, the stories, the, the words of Jesus reside before they were written down? And there's only one possibility when you, when you look at the Gospels, and that is they clearly resided in the synagogue. Another thing that people don't understand is that Christianity did not separate itself from the synagogue until approximately the year 88 of the Common Era, or 58 years after the life of Jesus has come to its earthly end. Now, I want to stop right there because I think this is a very important point for our, our viewers to, to understand because the point you've been made, making is that because it resided in the synagogue is that there was a Jewish lens and a, tr a tradition of mythology and non-literal writing that's that, was, uh, that was a central part of these Gospels. I think that's absolutely true. When you read the Gospels and understand how they came into being, you see that Jesus is portrayed as a new Moses, he's portrayed as a new Elijah, he's portrayed as the Son of Man, which is a very Jewish concept. He's even portrayed as the suffering servant from Second Isaiah. He's portrayed as the shepherd the king shepherd. From, Zech from Zechariah. Uh, and these images are wrapped around him, and, and they, they cannot possibly be literal. Uh, for example, look at the Moses story uh, first. Matthew, who makes Moses the primary image by which he understands Jesus, begins his story with the episode of Herod going down to Bethlehem and killing all the Jewish boy babies to get rid of this pretender to his throne. Every Jew reading that would know that's a Moses story because the Pharaoh went down to Egypt and killed all the Jewish male babies to try to get rid of this threat to his, his sovereignty. And then that story, is the Moses story, is carried all the way through. Uh, the Moses Red Sea experience is likened to Jesus' baptism experience. And Moses splits the Red Sea, Jesus splits the heavenly waters. That's the way that these Jewish writers were saying Moses, Jesus is even greater than the greatest of our heroes in the past. When Moses gets through the Red Sea, he wanders around in the wilderness for 40 years trying to figure out what it means to be the chosen people. Jesus is portrayed as wandering around in the wilderness trying to understand what it means to be God's Messiah. It's a Moses correlation all the way through. So the New Testament stories are all derived from the Old Testament they stories. They are interrelated. Many, derived right. might be too strong a word, but they're deeply interrelated. They're shaped and formed to make Jesus the fulfillment of the expectations of first century Jewish people about what Messiah was going to be. That's the interpretive clue now, to the you, New Testament. You have never been one to skirt controversy and that you've taken it on in a big way in this book. So let's just talk about some of the, the, the points you make. I mean, first to uh, Jesus' parents, Joseph and, and, and Mary. I mean, you believe that this probably, again, is not literal, that in fact it's a fictionalized composite. I think that's correct. Uh, it's easier to see that with Joseph than it is Mary because culture, the Western civilization of the Christian church has elevated Mary into this enormous mm -hmm. figure and you get the idea that she's a very prominent figure in the Gospels. She really isn't. The name of Mary occurs only one time in the first Gospel and that's on the lips of a critic who shouts out of the crowd, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? A very pejorative comment, I mean. That's the only time the word Mary is written. The only time the mother of Jesus is described in Mark's Gospel, it's quite pejorative. Uh, she thinks Jesus is out of his mind, and she goes with his brothers to take him away. That'd be in chapter 3 and in chapter 6. That's sort of gotten lost in the cultural development of the image of the Virgin. Uh, and, and I could take all the stories about Mary in the Gospels themselves, and they don't paint a very favorable portrait. Even when you get to the fourth Gospel, uh, she's the one that keeps demanding that Jesus show his messianic power by changing water into wine and he rebukes her in the early chapters, I think chapter 2 of the book of, of John. So the image of Mary is a very tangential and almost a negative image in the Gospels themselves, but Mary rises in Christian history into an enormously powerful icon, I think primarily because the Christian faith was so masculine that it had no place for a feminine. And just like the yin and the yang of China, you can't repress the feminine part of human nature, so it has to come back. So it came back as the Virgin Mary and as Mother Church in the mm -hmm. Western world. But the figure itself, uh, the virgin birth, for example, I don't know of a single biblical theologian of world rank that thinks the virgin birth is literal history. And I think it's time we say that to the world at large. 
Now, you might find one at some of these fundamentalist schools, but they wouldn't be recognized as scholars in the academies of Christian learning around the world. What would be the, the purpose of the writers to depict Mary as a virgin? Well, I think that, first of all, this, you have to know that the story enters the Christian tradition in Matthew, which is a ninth decade. There's no mention of the virgin birth in the writings of Paul, who wrote between 50 and 64. Mm -hmm. In fact, Paul says Jesus is born of a woman, born under the law, and the word woman does not say virgin at all. So and this born. is only 70, 90 years after, after the fact. That's correct. And it enters in Matthew. And one of the reasons it enters in Matthew is that Matthew likes to cherry pick out of the Old Testament things that he thinks Jesus fulfills. And Matthew had a problem. He didn't read Hebrew. Every time he quotes the Jewish Bible, he quotes it from a Greek translation. And so it comes across this verse in Isaiah 7, 14, that in his Greek translation, he translates, uh, well, he, he, he uses a Greek translation. And he, and he thinks it says, Behold, a virgin will conceive and bring forth a child. Well, if you read it in Hebrew, it doesn't say that at all. The word virgin doesn't appear in the Hebrew text of Isaiah. It's just 7. a bad translation. It's just a bad translation. They translated the Hebrew word Alma with the Greek word Parthenos, and the connotation of virgin is only in the Greek word Parthenos. But the most fascinating thing is that in Hebrew, that verse says, Behold, a woman is with child. Well, and where I come from, if a woman is with child, she's not a virgin. Uh, but so the, the text was even wrong. The third thing that's wrong with that is that that verse in Isaiah was to be a sign given to the king that the armies that were at that moment surrounding uh, Jerusalem, and this is in the 8th century before the birth of Jesus, the army of the northern kingdom in Syria was surrounding Jerusalem trying to conquer the Jews to put a puppet king to make them be forced to be in an alliance against the Assyrians who were about to destroy the northern kingdom, which they did in 721. And, and so Isaiah the prophet gives the king this sign that a young woman is with child and the nation is going to go on. Uh, a, a sign that's not going to happen for 800 years doesn't help when you've got an army around your city at that moment. So that, you know, there's nothing about the story that is historical, uh, and yet the tradition is so deep. Now, it's one of the things I point out in this book, in a second century document called the Dialogue with Trifo, Justin Martyr, one of the early Christians, his name was Justin, but he was martyred, so that's become part of his name. Justin Martyr and Trifo are in this dialogue, and Trifo, the Jew, tells Justin Marta that that's a total mistranslation of Isaiah 7:14, But it didn't matter. Christianity had enormous power at that point, and they weren't going to listen to somebody they didn't regard as authoritative. But you can go back and read it in the dialogue with Trifo. So it's, we built this enormous um, uh, structure, uh, this enormous icon about the Virgin Mary that is simply non-biblical. You, you also doubt that there were 12 historical disciples, that this too is an analogy that harkens back to, I think uh, that's to earlier, earlier. The first writing. thing that causes you to doubt that is the New Testament doesn't agree on who the 12 are. Uh, there are at least 15 names that you can find that are thought of as disciples. And so they've spent this game throughout history trying to say, well, Thaddeus is really uh, Judas, and, and they just got names wrong or something like that. But they didn't have 12. Uh, and the idea of 12 disciples is a messianic symbol. Remember that this is 40 to 70 years after the time of Jesus, and the messianic symbols are being wrapped around him. One of the messianic symbols was that he would be the founder of a new Israel. Mm -hmm. The old Israel had 12 tribes. The new Israel has to have 12 tribes. So 12 is important as an interpretive clue. And Jesus is quoted in both Matthew and Luke as saying to the disciples, you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The analogy of the 12 tribes of Israel with the 12 disciples is a deep part of the, the formation of the New Testament. I, I'm sure he had disciples. And I don't think the number was 12. Nor were they all male, in your view. Oh, that's absolutely correct. That's, again, male prejudice. Again, if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will discover that Jesus has female disciples who have followed him all the way from Galilee. Now, they don't become visible in the story until Jesus is arrested and all the male disciples forsake him and flee. So the only ones that are left are the women. That's why the women play such a strong part in the story of the crucifixion and in the story of the resurrection. But they, are, they were, this, the scripture is clear that they were with him all the way from Galilee. Jesus had female disciples, Jesus had male disciples. The female disciples had a leader, her name was Magdalene. The, the male disciples had a leader, his name was Simon Peter. 
And so that, that, you know, if you read the Bible with Jewish eyes, these are very clear all the way through. You touched on uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection. I mean, when I was a young man going to, to church, I was told this is the foundational story upon which Christian faith rests. You've said in this book, to literalize Easter, both the story of resurrection and the ascension has become the defining heresy of traditional Christianity. Explain that. Yeah. There's no doubt that Jesus was crucified. Uh, there's no doubt that after his crucifixion, I don't know when after, I don't think three days is the right amount of time, but at some point after the crucifixion, there was clearly an experience of such life-changing dimensions that the disciples who had forsaken him and fled were reconstituted and were from that moment on quite willing to die for the truth of that vision. It's only when you get to the last two Gospels, Luke, which I would date between the late 80s and the early 90s, and, Ma and John, which would be dated from, say, 95 to 100, that the body of Jesus, the physical body of Jesus, becomes very physical. But it's also interesting that no story of Jesus literally walking out of the tomb appears until about the third century. Now you get the implication that he's walked out of the tomb, but nobody actually tries to describe the moment when the tomb opened and Jesus walked out until you get, I think it's the Gospel of Peter in the third century, which was one of the apocryphal Gospels that didn't make it. But you get, you get a physical Jesus only in Luke and John. That's where Thomas wants to feel the nail prints. And, and that was important because what they wanted to be sure they could communicate was that the same Jesus they experienced in whatever resurrection was, was identified with the Jesus that they had known and as the person of history. So Christianity rests on the resurrection. It doesn't rest on the physical resuscitation of the body as the interpretation of the resurrection. Well, we should, we should make it clear, too, that the book isn't simply, you know, shattering all of these myths and debunking uh, various parts of, uh, of the Bible. In fact, you, you propose and offer a new way of understanding Jesus' divinity that is in contrast to this literal interpretation of Jesus being the Son of God. Talk to me about that. Well, in the, uh, when the Gospels are written, the Gospels start out in this Jewish world, but by the time the Gospels begin to be interpreted, they're interpreted in a Greek world. And the Greek world is dominated by the thought of the Neoplatonists who were dualistic. That is, they divided heaven from earth as if they were two separate realms, God from human life, divine from human, uh, souls from bodies, spirits from flesh. They, it was, it, these were clearly two different realms. And it was in that frame of reference that, that the early Christian church uh, wrote its creeds and developed its doctrines and its dogmas. It's interesting to me that the earliest gospel, Mark, about 70, Mark portrays Jesus as fully human who comes to his baptism. And at his baptism, the heavens open and the Spirit is poured out upon him, and that's the moment God enters him in the first gospel. By the time you get to Matthew and Luke, they regard that as somehow inadequate, so God has to enter him at the moment of conception. But by the time you get to John, the fourth gospel, at the end of the century, God is part of who he is from the dawn of creation, because Paul, John starts, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and it's the Word that was enfleshed in Jesus of Nazareth. And so, you know, you watch it go from baptism to uh, conception to the dawn of creation uh, as, the, as the means of explaining how it was that we experienced this divine presence in the life of Jesus. I think there's a better way we can do that by looking at the depths of his humanity. Many fundamentalists would say this kind of talk that we're having right now is virtual heresy and that you're yeah. basically destroying the, the, the Christian faith. What, what's your response to that constituency? Well, I grew up in that uh, tradition, so I understand it. And it was terribly important to me as a child uh, because my life, I don't want to go in my biography, but my life was a pretty unstable life as a child. My father died when I was 12. He had been a pretty active alcoholic. My mother was not an educated woman. My my fundamentalist religion probably gave me the strength to endure that kind of childhood. But by the time I was 14, my fundamentalistic religion kept me from growing, either in terms of my understanding of God or my understanding of the world. So it began to, to shatter and fall apart. And I didn't go from, from fundamentalism into what I am now in one step. I, there were a number of intermediate steps. But I finally came to the conclusion that God is beyond my human capacity ever to know fully. Uh, I tell people that a horse could never explain what it means to be human. 
no matter what you did, no matter how a horse might be able to talk, a horse could never enter into the human experience and describe what it's like to be human. I wonder why we think human beings can describe what it's like to be God. And yet we've done that throughout history. We've said, God is this, and if you don't agree with this, I'll burn you at the stake, or I'll go to war, I'll persecute you. That's nothing except human arrogance. God is a mystery into which we walk. And the more deeply you walk, the more that mystery just surrounds you. Uh, I consider myself today a God-intoxicated person, almost a mystic, but I have, I have no idea of what human words I would use to try to articulate who God is or what God is. I can articulate what I believe my experience of God is. On the other side of the religious debate, we've seen a tremendous popularization of you know, people like Richard Dawkins and the God delusion, you know, attacking uh, religious thinking of, uh, of any sort. I mean, what's your response to that school of And I thought? think in good, for good reason. If you look at the history of religion in the Western world, it's one of the reasons I don't like religion. It's not a very edifying history. I mean, we've sponsored the Crusades to kill the infidels of the Middle East. Uh, we've done the Inquisition to burn the heretics at the stake. We've fought the Thirty Years' Religious War. We have, throughout our history, used the Bible to justify the institutions of the divine right of kings, slavery, to oppose science and Galileo, to keep women in positions of second-class citizenship, and to bash and abuse gay and lesbian people in our own time. The Bible has been quoted in all of those things. Those are all destructive. We've also calculated or articulated the Christian faith in such a way as to portray it as saying, God rescues you and me from sin. Now, the only reason, way you can keep telling that story is that you have to keep concentrating on sin. So that there's a great deal of Christianity that just is calculated to make you feel evil. You know, we're told what wretched, miserable sinners we are. We go to church and the primary thing we say in liturgy is, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. We talk about God killing Jesus, and that's to say it in a very uh, strong and, and somewhat hostile way. God killing Jesus instead of killing you and me, so that we can say, Jesus died for my sins. To me, that's nothing but a guilt trip. And if I am so evil that God has to kill Jesus in order to forgive me of my sins, it seems to me I've turned God into an ogre, I've turned Jesus into a victim, and I've turned human life into some sort of wretched, miserable experience. How does that square? with the Jesus who is quoted as having said in the fourth gospel, my purpose is that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. I've never known people to be told how wretched they are. But and for let all, that that, help all, them. all that literal criticism of the, the gospels in, in the Bible, you think that Dawkins and his ilk are wrong equally? Well, I think, I, I, no, I Not think. Not equally. But no, that, I think but Dawkins is right. I think Dawkins is right to be critical of that kind of religion. And the problem with Richard Dawkins, whom I know, is, is that he has not yet discovered that there's another kind of way to understand the Christian faith, except in terms of that frame of reference. The, the, the fundamentalists are growing because they offer security. You can't think, but they offer security. I loved a poster I saw in a church that once said, why is it that churches that claim to have all the answers don't allow any questions? I think we ought to ask that. This, this rise of secular humanism in our society, this godless state, this understanding of God as having no relationship to the kind of life, is a fairly modern thing. And it's because I think we've not allowed Christianity to evolve into what I think Christianity can be. This is either the fourth or fifth time we've had a conversation over the last uh, 12, 12 years. This is you know, one out of a series of books you've been writing on the subject. You've been on this crusade for a long time. I mean, given what's happening in America now, are you more or less optimistic than when you started on it? I think I'm more optimistic because I think what has to happen in historical movements is you have to reach a crescendo where you see the absurdity of the pattern you're walking before you can begin to open to something new. And I think that's what we've got in America today. What we finally had was that we, got it, we voted into office an administration with deep ties to fundamentalistic religion and it began to live itself out, and it seems to be pro-war. That's a really interesting thing, that the biggest support for the Iraq war in America today is in the religious right. The rest of the country has said, no, this war is wrong. It's in attitudes toward women. 
uh, birth control and abortion. It's in attitudes toward gay people. It's in attitudes toward end-of-life decisions with the Terry Schiavo case. And when America sees this kind of religion now in positions of power, there's been a recoiling. And, and at least a part of that is that the religious mentality, which people thought of as virtue, uh, <clears throat> has shown up to be anything but virtuous. Uh, some really rather terrible behavior has happened in the name of God in, in this administration. So we're in a place that, that uh, I think we're ready to start something new. We got into this fundamentalism, I think, because of the, the desegregation decision that affected people's understanding of security in the South, where this religion begins. Remember in 1976, we elected Jimmy Carter, mm -hmm. born-again Christian, really wonderful human being, but he wasn't able to stem the anxiety. So after four years, we elected Ronald Reagan for eight years, and he was a cowboy, and, the, and he'd put law and order and virtue back into place. But then we finally got secure enough in 1992 where we sort of got away from that. We elected the two Southern boys, Clinton and Gore, and America experienced an enormous uh, growth of uh, money and all sorts of things, and the anxiety began to go down. But Clinton's personal behavior caused a, a, a sort of distaste to go in America, across America. And, and so we turned away from his vice president and elected George Bush without realizing, I think, that George Bush was as deeply committed to some 19th century uh, understandings as he is. And then we had the 9-11 thing, which created enormous anxiety. It's the first time my country has been attacked in a war since 1776 or maybe 1812. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. We fought wars on other people's country, but never in ours. And this was an act of war. So the anxiety was rampant. And so, you know, America is at a point where I think we're headed toward a renaissance. And it doesn't really matter whether the next, president, next president is a Republican or a Democrat because nobody is seeking the endorsement of President Bush today. No Republican is seeking his endorsement because that's not a popular place to go. So we're in a, it's sort of as if we, we had to go through that catharsis before we settled all that. As always, John Spong, I want to thank you very much for joining me. It's, it's a real a pleasure. It's a pleasure, Alan. My pleasure. Thank you.